break, airplane mode. I don't know what else they say on the jokes already? It's cool. Thanks for that, uh, Jed. Uh, this room is awesome, Jed. Thanks for having us. I love the look. That we've got some costume changes for the musical numbers. Oh, man. Uh, the exposed brick. I guess here you just call it brick. Uh, and then, I don't know, I'm supposed to make an announcement about fire safety. Um, in case there's a fire, if you can see, there's there's a little yellow cupboard back there. If there's a fire, that's how you get from this room to the land of Narnia. So just single file right back here. I, I especially like the stage. Um, did you subcontract MacGyver to make this thing? Because, okay, we need a stage in 20 minutes. We need some power dishwashing bins. We need some particle board. We need the playing field from last year's butt bowl. Duct tape to it. That's going to do, my hands get shaky, a lot of beer are going to be spilled on this. I need a surface. Right at 50 yard line. Nice seats. This is great. Um, I, I love this part of the country. I just came uh, from Montana. I was around there for the 4th of July. And uh, I got to have the conversation I have with my relatives every 4th of July, which is where they complain about that fireworks aren't dangerous enough anymore. But when we have the same conversation, they're like, you know, Jim, you know, back in the day, shoot, you'd go right down the road, and for 50 cents, you'd get a dozen uh, Roman candles that could be seen with uh, Air Force radar, and they'd throw in some quarter sticks of dynamite for the kids. That's how they talk with my relatives. Like, oh, shoot, nowadays you buy fireworks, and they can't even pierce police armor. I don't know what's happening with that. My, my cousins are all super racist, but uh, every year they, uh, they reach out to the Native American community by going on the res and buying uh, leftover mortar shells from Operation Desert Storm. Like, yeah, that was a short conflict. There's a lot of leftovers from that one. Like, because I, I like, like safety, people always tell you like, yeah, safety comes first, safety's the top priority. Like, like, yeah, but especially like at theme parks, like I need, I need more danger in my life. Like theme parks, like let's loosen a few bolts on the tilt-a-whirl. Play some tilt-a-Russian roulette. Especially like on the 4th of July, let's not have safety be the first priority. Let's have it like maybe 4th after hot dog eating contests. Like it can't be the top priority. Like the first priority is to celebrate freedom. And the only way we can do that is by shooting off Roman candles into the neighbor's rose bush. Now that, that is to test the police response time. And, and then we're going to set off enough explosives to derail an armored prisoner transport. Because that's how we do things up here. Because that's the way it was explained to me in Montana by Uncle Willie. Hey, Uncle Willie, was it more fun when you had a full set of fingers? Was it still okay then? Uh, safe, so screw safety. And, and you know, on the 4th, not safety so much. On the 5th of July, we can go back for using those explosives as they were intended, which is to help you remove a stump from your backyard. Or like to, to get a, a train tunnel through the Rocky Mountains. Creating jobs for normal old Idahoans, I appreciate your vote. That's right, thank you. So, uh, so safety can't... Safety shouldn't always, if safety always came first, no one would have ever come up with the idea of shooting tracer rounds into a milk jug full of gasoline. Which I just found out is a thing around here. <laughs> we, were, we were coming, have you done that before? I'm getting some, uh, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna end up on some uh, Department of Homeland Security list. That. That's okay. Not once for I've done that. That's okay. Uh, you, I just found out that not only does that happen around, not only is that a thing, but it's so popular they had to make a law in five states, and Idaho is one of them, against explosive targets. Which is, like, I can't believe there's a lot, that's like someone saying, okay, you know what, this has gone too far, new law, no sneaking up on hibernating bears and ringing a cowbell while wearing a Freddy Krueger mask. Okay, put a stop to it. I can't believe I need to say this, but we're not doing that anymore. But I, I love that around here. I, I love this part of the country. 
Um, like this, this is a part of the cut, like not too far from here, a guy tried to jump over the Snake River Gorge in a motorcycle. And no one tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> I love that about the Snake River area. But no one was like, hey, evil, um, I'm from here, and the other side of that gorge is way farther than it looks. Everyone's like, I wonder how this is going to turn out. I think it worked out okay. He's still alive, right? No. Okay, never mind then. But, yeah, so Snake River, that... That spirit lives on, I'm happy to see. When we were coming over uh, over the bridge about an hour ago, there were a bunch of little kids, and I mean like eight or nine-year-olds, that were jumping off the busy highway bridge into the Snake River, which is awesome. Those kids rule. Um, I, it was more on the Minidoka side. I don't know if there's less rules over there. <laughs> Not so much on the Cassia side. But <laughs> what? Kaja? Oh, Kaja. What are you ordering today? I will, uh, for starters, I'm going to have the cheesy for Kaja. Maybe a shrimp carbonara. Kaja. That's just like part of Narnia that we're going to later on tonight. Elves and fawns. What was I saying? I, I got worried about the kids jumping into the river. I was like, I rolled down the window. I was like, hey, there might be snakes in that river. Kids, they still jumped. That's that's just how it rolls over here. So um, I, uh, I, the first joke I ever told in my life was right by the Snake River Canyon when I was a little kid. I was six years old. We were driving somewhere. I was the oldest of five kids that my parents had in college, and I'm not, I don't know why. I don't I don't think it was like to prove their notion of the sanctity of. of of life or whatever. I think they just didn't know how that worked. Like, I think they were like, why is it that every year, nine months after the Montana State Homecoming game, another one of those happens? So we're like, we're like in this wooden, wood panel like Clark Griswold station wagon. And we're driving through there. There's just kids. This was before you had to wear seat belts. There's just like kids inside of luggage. Like there's one kid sitting where my mom's feet were supposed to go. Another kid, like, just dangling from the emergency brake. And, like, my dad, who's such a good guy, he sees a hitchhiker. Like, at the time, we called them drifters, but, like, he saw a hitchhiker. Right on, the, I think it was, like, on 84. And uh, pulls over, picks this guy up. Like, I don't know where he sat, because we, like, seven people in a station wagon. We were, like, one person away from clown car, officially. And so we picked this guy up, and uh, uh, I, I told this joke. Actually, it wasn't so much of a joke as it was falsely accusing my parents of child abuse. <laughs> I was like, hey, Jeff, guess what? We have a dryer for drying clothes at my house. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, okay, that's cool. And I said, and when we're bad, they put me in it and turn it on. <laughs> and my parents turned around like, <laughs> no, they don't. And I looked him dead in his eyes. I was like, when I'm bad, they put me in it and turn it on. <laughs> and seriously, we... Um, the guy was like, hey, I want to take pictures of this gorge over here. So we're like, oh, yeah, we could use a bathroom break. The guy refused to get back in the car, which is hilarious. I think, I, I didn't, I think he didn't know what to do with that information. Like, I, I'm pretty sure there were mandatory reporting laws at the time, but he just wanted out. So he's like, I'm a drifter with a record. I don't, I don't need this heat. We, uh, we drove here up from, uh, from Nevada. And Nevada is not so much, it's not so much daredevilish, like disregarding safety like up here. It's more like just a lot of bad decision making. Like it's just a, a desolate land that's abandoned by God. Like, for example, in, in Nevada, like we, we have a hugely unnecessary amount of gambling. Like there's a casino in every orifice. Like there's the, the major casinos. And then we have these little storefront casinos called Dotties. And they're like, for, just to let you know, they're the type of casino that fits right in between an Arby's and a Supercuts. They're like Satan's waiting room. They're, these casinos are the casinos that, they're like, for people whose self-esteem is too low to go in real casinos. So people are like, hey, you want to go to the Cal Neva do some gambling? What, a real casino? What do I look like, the Sultan of Brunei? No thanks. I need to go to a casino 
that's the size of an Arby's where I can ash my cigarette into a half-empty Slurpee cup. <laughs> it's great. And uh, by law in Nevada, to have a casino, you also have to serve food. And you get a great three-course meal in these little casinos, as long as all three courses are M&Ms or Pringles. I mean, like the M&Ms that still have the, the tan ones, like they're left over. They only serve food that should be crumbled up and sprinkled onto real food. Like, what they should do is serve mental health counseling when you go in there. Like, hey, welcome to Dottie's. What's going on? Uh, I'm a nice guy in a white cardigan. I'll be your mental health counselor for the next half hour while you play Masters of Bass Fishing penny slots. So just, I'll be here for the next hour or until you run out of your 18 nickels. It's great. They, uh, they, they have this rule in these storefront casinos, which is... Which is, um, after dark, there's, there, they only have like one drunken employee, so after dark you actually have to ring a doorbell to get into the casino. Which leads to one of my favorite games, how shitty do you have to look to not be let into a storefront <laughs> casino? Like, I'm pretty sure you could look like the cast of Machete Kills and they'd be like, right this way, sir. You guys have seen Machete Kills. That's what he does. I don't even think you need a gun to rob one of these places, though. Like, they've just got the, the one drunk guy who's being paid minimum wage. Like, he's not shoulder rolling into a bullet. Like, you could rob a storefront casino with a rotten banana. <laughs> Show up. And they, like, you could, you could rob one of those with a Nintendo Duck Hunt gun with the cord still hanging down. You could go in and rob one of those places by holding a feral cat. The cat's like, hey, man, I don't want to be in here. Leave me alone. I wish one of those places would get robbed when I'm in there, because it would lead to something I've always wanted to say, which is, it's up to us now. <laughs> you guys have seen Red Dawn, right? <laughs> Wolverines! Like, you'd, you'd make a projectile out of somebody's oxygen tube. The two guys in the bathroom using the glory hole get them involved in an ambush. It'd be fantastic. The scary thing is in Reno, for those of you who've never been to Reno, it gets even worse than that. It, it, it's gotten really shady. Uh, we like to blame it on the economy, but really, we're just bad people, I think. <laughs> this is the main. So um, there's a one casino that I know about because my bus route to work goes by it. Yeah, I'm on the way up. So my bus, you meet, you meet some funny people on the uh, city bus in Reno. like. Um, there's one woman who got on the bus and, and immediately started belting out church hymns at the top of her lungs. And that impresses me because I'm amazed anyone can get on a Reno City bus and continue believing in the existence of God. We have a lot of tweakers. I don't know if you have those up here, like meth heads. A lot of those guys ride the bus too. And uh, meth heads have a funny way of paying for the bus. See, for most people, a bus ride costs $2. For meth heads, a bus ride costs getting halfway in the door, mumbling some BS to the driver until he's like, fuck it, get on. <laughs> oh my god, I don't care. Get, get on. Like, every, bus, every bus driver is like Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon. He's like two days away from retirement. He's too old for this shit. He's like, oh my god, I don't care. <laughs> the bus is so gnarly. And uh, I, I cannot explain to you the amount of chip, like, Frito dust on the floor. It's like, I don't know how so many Fritos get on the floor of Reno buses. I, I think people learn to eat by watching the Cookie Monster. Or, like, they're pouring some out for their homies. Either way, it looks like somebody's making a pie crust, like, at all times. So most of the tweakers uh, are either coming from or going to this casino called Diamond's Casino. And that's where the methods go in Reno. Stay away from it unless you're on some kind of mission. Because what, what it's, it's like what it would look like in a real life zombie invasion. Except when meth heads bite you, you don't become a zombie, you just get hepatitis C. It's actually a more painful way to go. Like, like I don't know, I don't know who, what non-drug addicted person is going to these casinos. It's like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, you know me, I like to kick back, relax, have a cold one, and play some video poker in the middle of World War Z. 
I wouldn't go into Diamond's Casino. I would not even let my Dungeons and Dragons character go to Diamond's Casino. And that elf has like leather body armor, battle axe, boxer shorts of virginity, level five virgin. That should have led into my Narnia material right there. <laughs> Not many of you guys are with the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. That's good, you're healthy. You're into hiking. Board games, maybe not so much. That's good. I like that. Um, so, um, do you guys have, uh, uh, so, um, Rena, I, you guys are having a good time. I see you're drinking, like, uh, very, very large beers in the front right here. That's fantastic. Are you going to finish those? Wow. Oh, be sure to... Man, that is great. Is there some uh, citrus in there for in case you're getting scurvy while drinking that beer? Now, that looks so tasty. I'm, I'm, I'm really jealous of you guys. I'm not supposed to drink a lot anymore. Um, I, I got told I had a little problem. I was like, who, who says I have a problem? The state of Nevada says that? I don't listen to that F up. That's like your drug dealer telling you to settle down. So I was like, all right. I, I guess, you know, oh, you hit a couple cars and those cars were a mile apart from each other, in the cops' defense. So, um, things change when, when you're not drinking much anymore. Um, for example, no one tells you you'll never be able to pick up a girl in a bar ever again. Believe it or not, this actually used to happen, like, despite the... Like, like I'd have cool lines, I'd have fun lines, I'd be like, Hey baby, you'd look pretty good giving me awkward directions back to your house tomorrow morning. <laughs> or like, like a 50. By the way, when you're that drunk and talking to a girl, talking to them is essentially the same as breathing on them. It's just like menthols and sadness and just in their direction. But once in a while, the girl has low enough self esteem, she'll respond back. She'll say something super clever like, You got a funny nose. Which means transmission received. Permission to come aboard, Don Juan de Marco. And we'd, we'd go back to her house and get it on drunk style, by which I mean she'd pass out and I'd get into her fridge and eat some potato salad with my hands. I'd, be, I'd become like a stoned cat burglar at that point. It's just wonderful. And then we'd, we'd wake up the next morning and kind of piece stuff back together. Like, um, like she'd be like, why is my blender broken? And I'd be like, if your blender, first of all, if your blender can't handle little Froyo and Twix, it was broken to begin with. <laughs> so that's awesome. How much? Uh, how am I doing, Mark? How am I doing on time? Sorry. One, one minute. Sorry. Just a little, little, little. Uh... Eleven minutes, forty-four seconds. Nice. You guys. Um, okay. So you guys, I, um, I, uh, they got these things. Now that I'm, I'm sober, I notice people drinking like yourselves in a responsible way. You're sipping your way up to a .05 blood alcohol level and just like cutting yourselves off because you got kids at home. Or maybe the kids are in the car with the windows rolled down. Like, and that's, oh, look at me, just, I'm, like, like, like people will be on wine walks and like I'll get resentment about that because they're like, hey, look at me just walking with my wine, not spilling any. Just like, yep, yeah, and my, I, I've got a dog here, and it's not one of those St. Bernard's with like a cask full of brandy around its neck to revive me. Like, and they're like, oh, look at me, I'm drinking during the daylight downtown because I totally don't have prior arrests for doing exactly that. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, that's what these people are saying to me with their eyes and all their moderation. So, uh, uh, I used to live in San Francisco, and uh, once in a while, people knew I liked to drink, so they would invite me to go wine tasting. They'd be like, hey, Jim, you like to drink, right? You like wine tasting? And I'd be like, For, stop poking me in the stomach. And no, I don't like it. So, for a guy like me, like wine t tasting is not drinking. Like It is literally like tasting. Like they, First of all, what they, they don't give you a glass of wine. They give you an empty wine glass, which in my hands is just shaking on the counter. And like, they, they give you a speech about as long as the Gettysburg Address. And I see you yawning back there. I'm going to get you back with this next funny joke. So, wait for this. Here it comes. So they, they, 
they give you like a hummingbird's beak worth of wine in the glass. Like, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure Jesus was offered more wine when he was nailed to the cross. First of all, like, basically, I'm a dog that wants to play fetch, and the bartender is just pump faking a tennis ball. It's fantastic. I don't know what to do with that. And uh, they give you these appetizers that are like equally puny, so I can't like eat away the desire. They're like, oh, here, and it's Napa Valley, so they're all like snoot. They're like, oh, here, play, try these prosciutto wrapped jars of marmalade. They're perfect for if, if your Melba toast isn't persimony enough. It's like, get out of my face. Like, here, please try these strawberries. They were picked by free range illegal aliens. <laughs> Like, the most offensive thing is when, like, total California style, they'll, they'll bring you a plate that just has, like, a smear on it. I'm like, was Bob Ross using this paint, this plate to mix watercolors? I don't even know what to, do I dip my Melba toast in this? Like, oh, this wine, they give you these speeches. This wine is, uh, you can taste the oakiness of the barrel, and it's reminiscent of the terroir, and it must have been a cool year because the wine is very sweet. Like, I just want a jug of night train, and I don't care if it's reminiscent of like it was wrung out of the sweaty turban of the Pakistani man who sold it to me. Like I just want a lot of it. I want, I want something that's reminiscent of a time I was hung upside down by my ankles over a keg of Natty Light. Can you remind me of that time? Like I want to remember that and be a normal human being. Actually, that's not normal for a 35-year-old. Some of you may be. There's some young people there. So um, I sometimes I, I go to these meetings and uh, and uh, I'm not gonna say which ones, but um, people people will be like, oh, I can't drink anymore, but I replace it with other stuff. Like, oh, now I've replaced it with sex. Now I just have sex all the time. And I'm like, that's an option for you. That's, that's you can choose that. Like, and they're complaining like we're supposed to feel sorry for them that. They don't have the fortitude to turn down all this human companionship that's getting thrown at them. Like, I'm supposed to feel sympathy for the giant game of sex dodgeball that their life has become. Like, like, uh, like I, I replaced it with something too. Like, like I replaced it with waging pop tart eating battles against myself. And on that sad note, you guys, thank you for being such an awesome crowd. Um, I'm gonna bring up uh, your headlining comic. He uh, is just on the road every weekend. He's been on Comedy Central. He does clubs and colleges all over America. Really lucky time. Really looking forward to his set. Here he comes, Mr. Mark Yaffe.